Thank you for those kind words of introduction. At the outset, I would like to thank National Institute of Advanced Studies uh, and Intech Bangalore for inviting me to deliver this lecture in this webinar. And today I would like to dedicate my presentation or my talk to the memory of Professor Sector, who had contributed mainly to the epigraphic studies in Karnataka and also in South India. And uh, also he was associated with NIAS. So uh, I dedicate it to Professor uh, S. Sector. Uh, the topic of my presentation today is revisiting the Mauryan Empire and its venture into South India. So I'll just give a very brief introduction about uh, the Mauryan inscriptions because we'll be mainly looking at the Mauryan inscriptions because the journey can only be undertaken uh, on the basis of these and uh, archaeological sources. So uh, South India already had a megalithic culture which was uh, there coexisting with the early historic features and uh, suddenly we start getting inscriptions and uh, Ashok was the first to issue inscriptions uniformly throughout the subcontinent right from Afghanistan to Karnataka. So here is a map on your screen which shows the distribution of the Ashokan ethics right from Afghanistan to Karnataka and Andhra Pradesh in southern part of the subcontinent. And uh, in the west, we have Girnar uh, in the Gujarat Kathiawa region. And then finally, in the east, we have Dhali and Jogar in Odisha. So here you can see Dhali and Jogar. So this is the kind of the distribution which we are getting. And uh, uh, the, about the Ashokan inscriptions, very briefly, uh, those who are not well conversed with the epigraphic material, let me just tell you that they are unique in character because they have the same or similar text which are duplicated. So like it's kind of photocopies of royal orders which have been sent everywhere. So there was a certain scheme which Ashoka had undertaken and he was just trying to send it from the center to the uh, Looking, that's the site where it was to be engraved. And the style and content of the inscriptions are also very unusual. You know, here these are proclamation of the emperor's moral and religious sentiment. And also these are exotetry in character and uh, he's speaking in first person to his subjects. So, uh, and uh, something very unique is the use of multiple languages and multiple dialects uh, and multiple scripts as well. So uh, this multilingual strategy probably he had taken from the Achaemenid Empire. Uh, so uh, the inspiration came from there. So broadly the Ashokan inscriptions can be divided into two categories. First is the rocketic category that is those engraved on rocks. And the second is those engraved on the pillars. This is a simple uh, categorization, though it's further com complex because uh, among the inscriptions which are engraved on rocks, we have major rock edicts, that is a set of 14 documents which were engraved uh, together. And uh, there are similar texts which are also called separate edicts, which we don't find in this set of 14, but there are two different sets, two separate edicts which are engraved as an addendum to the uh, major uh, rock edicts. So uh, these, they are called separate edicts. And the other name for that is Kalinga edicts, but we'll discuss it uh, later. And then uh, apart from the major rock edict category, we have minor rock edicts, which are very, very important in the South Indian context, because out of the 18 minor rock edicts, which uh, Ashoka had issued in different sites, uh, nine sites, that is almost 50% of them are in Karnataka and two in uh, rather three sites in uh, Andhra Pradesh. So most of it is in the southern part of the subcontinent, which is very, very important. And the second important thing is that minor rocketics are two in number, that is minor rocketic one and minor rocketic two. Minor rocketic one is engraved, uh, is found from Delhi till southern part of the subcontinent and not in the northwestern part. That's beyond Delhi to the uh, upwards towards the north. We do not find any uh, minor rocketic. But uh, minor rocketic two, 
was specifically only and only issued for the southern part of the uh, subcontinent. So it's only for the peninsular south, which is again very important. Apart from the major and the minor rocket eggs, we also have cave inscriptions. So cave inscriptions are only found in Barabar and Nagarjuni hills. The Barabar inscriptions were issued by uh, Ashok, which were donative in character, donated caves were donated to the Ajivika sites. And um, Dasharatha, who was his grandson, also donated caves to uh, the Ajivkas, and uh, we get his inscriptions in the Nagarjuna uh, caves, Nagarjuni caves, that's just beside the Barabar. So these are in uh, Bihar, so Gaya district, uh, particularly Jehanabad. So uh, these are the categories among the uh, rock inscriptions, and there are pillars. Pillars are very important because you know they uh, can be uh, placed in a particular locality where you want, but the rocket X will be um, engraved there where the rock is already existing. So uh, for pillars, you can have a choice of the specific position where you want it. But something very interesting is that by the pillars, Ashoka had actually defined his metropolitan because it was only uh, encircling his metropolitan area. Whereas the major rocket uh, scheme we will see uh, during the course of this presentation that the major rocket were engraved uh, on the borders of his empire. So they, were, they defined his empire basically, extent of his empire. And the minor rocket were randomly done everywhere. So among all these, uh, the pillar edicts are also divided into major and the minor pillar edicts. So the earliest ones to be issued among all the inscriptions are the minor rock edicts. So the first scheme which he had undertaken for engraving was his, the whole idea came when he started engraving the minor rock edicts. Then uh, uh, follow the major rock edicts. And the last uh, like project which he had taken were the pillar edicts. So they are much more uh, like um, well formed, the characters are well formed and the inscriptions are very uh, like well distributed. And uh, now you can see on your screen the map showing the major rocketic distribution. So this is just the border of his empire. They are only and only found on the borders. And uh, when we look at the southern part of the subcontinent, uh, if you start with the western part, you have Ginnar and Sopara here, you have Sanati and Eragudi here, you have Dhali and Jagar here. And here also Shabazgadi and Manchera, the only one which is standing alone is Kalsi. So it almost looks like he had selected two, two sites each closely located to get his uh, edicts engraved. So probably there was another version of Kalsi as well, where we have not uh, found it till now, discovered it. So now uh, there are other edicts as well, which I will just skip. The pillar edicts are uh, six in number, at six sites we have found the pillar edicts and the pillar edicts are also six in number. So it is a set of six documents like I have mentioned that the major uh, rocket edicts are 14 in number, minor rocket edicts are two, pillar edicts are six. But at Delhi Topra we find an extra um, Ashokan inscription which is called pillar edict seven. This is very, very important because this summarizes everything, you know. So while ending the whole scheme of engraving inscriptions, he had issued the final pillar edict saying that this is the end of the scheme of uh, engraving. So besides this, we also get two other edicts which have nothing to do with the scheme of engraving, but these are the Queen's edict uh, at uh, Allahabad Kosam and uh, schismatic which have a different context altogether. The uh, minor pillar edicts you can see they are five in number. So I'm just skipping all these because we'll just straight away go into the southern context as the time is very short. So when you see the distribution you can see a major concentration over here that is the southern sites and uh, the pillar sites are just here. So you see this major area has been defined by the uh, pillars and the major rocket eggs define the empire and the rest are random distributions. 
Now coming to the name of Ashoka. So the first very important thing is at a site called Maski, we get the first reference to the name of name that is Ashoka. Previous to this, the inscriptions were already known and uh, the um, inscriptions were read as Devanang Piyapiya Dasi Raja. So it was uh, not attributed to a single ruler, you know. So when we got the name of Ashoka in the Maski Edict, so all the inscriptions were now attributed to Ashoka. And um, this name Ashoka has only been found at four sites, which is very strange. And that too, only in the minor docketics. So mind it, the major docketics don't have the name at all, the name Ashoka. The only the minor docketics, which is just towards the beginning of his career, beginning of his engraving scheme, he mentions the name Ashoka. That too, in far area, which is very far removed from his metropolitan, he mentions the name Ashoka at three sites, Maski, Nittu and Uregola. These are the three sites in South India where uh, the name Ashoka occurs. And besides this, there is another place where the name uh, is mentioned. That's Gujara in Madhya Pradesh. So it is very, very strange that why do we find this name only at four sites uh, compared to the other which are more than 180. So uh, at Pangurhadiya, that is in Madhya Pradesh, we get a very distinct information from an inscription which says, Piyadasi Namaraja, that is the name of the ruler is Piyadasi. And we know that all the inscriptions have Devanang Piya, Piyadasi Raja. So his proper name was Piyadasi and Ashoka was another name which was uh, also used by the ruler. Now, taking another source that is Buddha Kosha, he mentions that the Prince Piyadasi assumed the, the title Ashoka at the time of his coronation. Buddha Kosha source is a little later, but of course, we do not know the authenticity of the statement, but he mentions categorically that the Prince Piyadasi assumed this name Ashoka at the time of his coronation. So if we believe that, then during the time of his coronation, he assumed it, he used it, but then he just thought of not doing it any further. So in the initial inscriptions only, he had used it. So these inscriptions which mention the name Ashoka might be put, uh, might be considered as one of the earliest ones. And then he decided to stick with his original name that is Piyadasi and all the Ashokan inscriptions have the name because they mentioned Devanang Piya Piya Dasi Raja. Now, something very interesting to substantiate this, to corroborate this, comes from the Nagarjuni Hills, that is the inscription issued by Dasharatta, his grandson. They also read Devanang Piya, then finally they don't read Piya Dasi. They don't have Piya Dasi. Piya Dasi is not a title hence. Directly comes Dasalathena, that is Devanang Piya Dasaratta. Similarly, in Ashoka's inscriptions, Devanang Piya Piyadasi. Now, finally, from this, I'll move on to another aspect in South India, particularly that all the minor rocket egg sites are almost in twins. Like Nitur has a twin in Uregala, Gavimat has a twin in Palkigundu, Brahmagiri has a twin in Siddhapura. So, uh, the southern site distribution is nine sites in Karnataka. It is Sannati, Maski, Nitur, Uregala, Gavimat, Palki Guntu, Jatinga, Rameshwar, Brahmagiri, and Sitapura. These are in Karnataka. Whereas when we look at Andhra Pradesh, there are three sites in Andhra. One is Erakudi, the other is Rajulamandagiri, and the third is Amaravati. Now, you can see on your screen that Sannati and Eragudi have been put in red because at Sannati and Eragudi, we get major rocket X. At Sanati, we only get major rocket eggs. At Eragudi, we get major rocket eggs as well as minor rocket eggs. So this is the scheme. And rest, all the sites have only minor rocket eggs. At Amravati, we get a very typical kind of an inscription, which is engraved on a pillar. It's a fragmentary uh, pillar on which uh, the inscription is engraved. But the content of the inscription is not that of a pillar. 
So pillar edit, it's not a general pillar edit content, but it is engraved on a pillar. Now you can see the location of the sites. They are a major, con like you can say a cluster of sites. The concentration is here and the uh, Sanati edict is somewhere here. This is Eragori. So uh, we can see the major distribution of all the minor rocket egg sites and above this Bahapur is Delhi basically. To the north of Delhi you do not find any uh, major, uh, minor rocket egg. Uh, whereas the major concentration is here, which is again very, very important. Now let me mention another very important thing, as I have mentioned, that minor rocket egg one and minor rocket egg two come together only in South India. So at times they are in two different stones and at times they come together. So minor rock, there, minor rocket egg can be divided into two categories. The place where you get minor rocket egg one only, at places you get minor rocket egg one in a separate rock, minor rocket egg two in a separate rock. There are sites where you get minor and minor rocket egg one and minor rocket egg two in a combined form. So the third category is the latest version when already one and two were issued and the uh, work of combining them was also done. So uh, let's see, visit the Maski, site of Maski. Uh, this is the Ashokan inscription. You can see uh, me in front of the Ashokan inscription. And here in the very first line, you have the name of Ashoka, Devanampiya Ashokasa. So uh, now the minor rocket dict one was issued after 10 years have elapsed, you know, like post coronation when uh, 10 years had elapsed, he issued this minor rocket dict one. Af he mentions that after the completion of 256 nights of a tour, which was a religious pilgrimage which he undertook, he decided to engrave the minor rocket dict. So the whole scheme of engraving edicts started with this. The content and context of the minor rocket dict have a strong and distinct Buddhist orientation and the message which the ruler wished to communicate far and wide at the end of his religious pilgrimage to sacred sites. So uh, these are reported from 18 sites. You can see the names of the sites on your screen. It's Eragudi, Rajul Mantakiri, Maski, Nittur, Uregala, Bahapur, Bairat, Gujarra, Rupna, Pangurariya, Ratanpurva, Aharaura and Sastra. So, Kavimat, Palki Gundu, Jatinga Rameshwar, Siddhapur, and Brahmakiri. So, finally, these are the 18 where you get the minor rocket eggs. Minor rocket egg one can again be divided into three categories. One is the shortest version, a very short version of the edict. And one is a medium version, one is a long version. Out of this, one would expect that the long version is very important, but it's just the other way around. The shortest version is the most important inscription because it carries only the imperative part. So it has whatever is the most important. So it says that it is two and a half years that have been converted into a lay worshiper and more than a year, uh, it's only more than a year that I have been zealous and in Jambudipa where gods had mingled with men and now they are uh, had not mingled with men, but now they are uh, mingling with men due to my zealous efforts. So all men high or low can attain heaven if they are zealous and may this effort gain permanence and grow in multiple proportions. So this was the content of the minor rocket act one. So basically this has a Buddhist orientation, but the medium version, we call it selective because it's a little longer than the imperative and it has it is actually imperative elaborated here what is added actually to the imperative part is added that after conversion to buddhism like we do not know exactly after becoming a buddhist lay worshipper i had been very ideal you know idle i did not do much i was not zealous and this notification or edict has been issued for this purpose to increase the zeal 
So this message should be conveyed to people of the Amta, that is to the frontier people, it should be conveyed. And so probably when he says that I have, I have not done much uh, in the last one and a half years, he just wanted to mention that in this one year, I have just taken this uh, project of engraving these and uh, promoting Buddhism in a sense. So, and they should be communicated to the Amta, that is to his frontier, so that the people staying outside his frontier may know about the ruler. And this oral order has been issued after the completion of 256 nights of the tour, this also he mentioned. So it was an oral order of the king. And then finally, there is a long version, which is a preamble and also an epilogue added to this particular version. Now, uh, minor rocket two, which is an addendum to minor rocket one, it's more imperative and instructive in character. So minor rocket two has two parts. Firstly, to, it says that how it has to be executed. So the scheme of things which I have already Ashoka has decided, how it will be executed and how it will be trans, transmitted in this whole uh, administrative hierarchy by following a certain hierarchy has been mentioned. Secondly, what is to be told and done? This is again a very important thing. So he's communicating to the uh, people in the hierarchy that what exactly is to be told and what exactly is to be done. So this is a written order as well as a verbal order to the administrative officers almost. So because South India was far removed from the metropolitan, so this was not required in North India, which was close to metropolitan, but this particular order, a written order and a verbal order was very important, how to execute things and what should be followed and what should be done, was done only and only for Southern part of his territory. Now, there is no Buddhist affiliation as such in this uh, it is. Uh, the manner of critic too. Four categories to whom the order should be passed are Brahmanas, the elephant riders, Hastyarohas, the Karanakas, that is the scribes, and the Yugajariyas, that is the drivers of chariots or the drivers carrying loads. So these are this is the mobile group to which actually the order has been mentioned. So they are the people who should be in the know-how of things. And then Brahmanas. Acharyas and Antavasins have been mentioned. With them were associated their people whom they were to instruct. So how will you instruct? It is mentioned. You should instruct your pupil, that is Brahmanas, should instruct your pupil in accordance with what is the ancient usage and custom. So that is, you should uh, do whatever is the Purana Prakriti in the region. So the word used is Purana Prakriti. So uh, that is the usages and customs of that region. So it is an organized effort to create a group of literates uh, who could have been employed in the service of the empire. So South India was very far from the uh, Mauryan metropolitan and they were uh, introducing a new language that is Prakrit to South India and a whole new kind of an administrative system order. So it was very important to have a group, core group of administrative officials. They should have been in charge of uh, record keeping as well. So creating a local set, a local set of officers was an administrative priority for the southern territory, which was quite far from the metropolitan. That the Brahmana and the Acharyas were sent from north, and then not a part of that society is reflected in the statement that what to be taught to the, what is to be taught to the apprentices, that is the antivasan. What will you teach exactly has been communicated. So of course, this becomes very clear that the apprentices will be from the local. And about Purana Prakriti and communicators, ancient uses and customs is the word that is Purana Prakriti. This is a kind of a two-way interaction between the uh, group which is communicating with the localites. So uh, it's not a one-way. And similarly, the orator or the narrator of the uh, edict who would read it out aloud, probably a Rajavachanika, he would have been a local person because he has to interpret it into the local language because practice is not the uh, language of the uh, South. So this was a new language which was introduced. Now we will move to the site of Maski, which is in Lingsur Taluk, Raichu district, Karnataka. You can see the site uh, here. 
and the few photographs of the site, some close-up views of the site. You can just enter it after climbing a few steps. And this is the Ashoka inscription. And here is the name in the first line, Ashoka, as I've already shown. This is the uh, uh, edict. And now from Maski, I will just, uh, uh, just a quick reference to this, that uh, the Maski edict was found by C. Beden, who was searching for gold in this whole region of um, Maski. And uh, this edict was a chance discovery. So this region was very um, famous for gold at that time. So um, in, uh, in 1915, Beden found this inscription. And uh, now from here, we'll move to the site of Sanati, which is by the, uh, on the banks of river Bhima. And uh, just located very close to the site of Kanagana Haldi. And uh, it's in the uh, district of Gulbarga uh, or Kalburki in Karnataka. And uh, you can see it's a freestanding stone on which the inscription is uh, engraved. And uh, it's unique because it's a major rock edict, number one. Secondly, it also has the separate rock edicts. Till now, before the Sanati edicts were discovered, uh, the separate edicts were also known as Kalinga edicts because they had been only found in Kalinga, that is Dhauli and Jaugad. But with the discovery of Sanati, uh, then this, uh, like this became a mis misnomer. The Kalinga edict uh, became a misnomer, and now they are only called uh, separate edict. Um, Professor D.C. Sarkar would like us to call them uh, rock edicts 15 and 16 because the rock edicts are a set of major rock edicts are a set of 14. So he says this is 15 and 16. Anyway, yeah, separate edicts are only two. This is the site of Sanati. Let us just see. Uh, this is uh, the Chandrala Parameshwari Temple, Chandralamba Temple. Uh, in Sanati and uh, just when we went for our field work we found that uh, on the uh, banks of river Bhima a sculpture was lying in the uh, temple campus uh, in broken in a few parts so we just assembled it and it was a beautiful sculpture of a goddess a Kalika Mahakalika and uh, it is mentioned in previous works that a Shukan inscription was found just underneath this uh, particular goddess, the idol. And uh, very quickly, I'll show you that uh, once the roof of the temple collapsed, a portion of the roof of the temple collapsed, and it just destroyed one of the, uh, the sculpture, one of the hands got broken. And uh, eventually, one of the devotees came and donated this uh, um, icon, a new fresh one, and this was removed. And when this was removed, uh, the Ashokan inscription was found. Uh, like beneath here. So the hinge of the uh, uh, sculpture was actually placed in the Ashoka inscription because it was a dress stone and the people when they were erecting this goddess in the Sanctum Sanctorial they thought that they need a stone to just get it steady. And they just uh, got a dress stone in the form of an Ashoka inscription which was lying here and there probably and they just brought it and uh, the goddess was just erected. And uh, when we look at the temple complex uh, inside the temple, we get a similar goddess here, uh, which is much earlier than the one we are discussing, uh, but with similar features. You know, this is a part of a Saptamatrika, this is probably Indrani, goddess Indrani, because you have an elephant and a uh, female uh, who is giving birth to a child. So these are the typical. Uh, sculptural features of uh, goddess Indrani. And so uh, we have three generations of goddess. This is the one which was give, which was uh, replaced after taking out the sculpture under discussion. So there are three generations of goddess, the first one, the second one, and the third, the uh, latest one, which is now worshipped inside the temple. So uh, now, from Sanati, we move on to the site of Kananganahalli, which is actually uh, in the greater Sanati complex uh, itself. And here we get the first ever sculpture of Ashoka, but not contemporary to Ashoka, because this is second century CE stupa, a Mahastupa, where this uh, sculpture has been found. 
and uh, it has several inscriptions even mentioning the names of the satavahana rulers so where one can understand that these are very late and uh, this is memory of ashoka still retained even after the um, like so many years you know now you can see this is the ashokan inscription and it is unique because this is the own that's the sanati inscription is now um, uh, preserved in the kanagana halli shed and here you see that this is engraved on both sides on our either sides and it's the only inscription in the subcontinent or only ashokan inscription which is a free standing stone engraved on both the sides so probably it indicates that it has been carried from some place which is very far and it was engraved and sent so to save the transportation of more ro uh, rocks like more stones it was decided to get it engraved on either sides and uh, here besides the rock edict uh, 12 and 14 we get separate edict 1 and 2 so which is very very unique as i said so there might be more stones you know like uh, more uh, panels probably which had rocket it one to uh, up to rocket it 11 so what was skipped here is only rocket 13 whereas we have uh, we will see that in a uh, separate rocket have been found in dhauli jogadi rodesa and here in sanati and here we have seen so at Thali, which is in Odessa, uh, this is an elephant, which is here actually, and this part has been like uh, clearly made like a notice board, chiseled off and prepared surface, and then only the yellow surface was actually prepared to engrave the inscriptions. So, in the yellow surface, we get this is the yellow surface, the one with the uh, blue is actually the yellow surface. So you have rocket it 1 to 6 here, rocket it 7 to 14 here, and then this space which was left out here, uh, separate rock edit 2 was actually engraved, which actually indicates that separate rock edit 2 came first and separate rock edit 1 came later. So the appellation separate rock edit 2 is wrong. The one which we call two should be called one and the one which we call one should be actually named two. So here they engraved two and later on they prepared this extra surface and <coughs> engraved uh, separate rocketed one. Now this can also be seen in jogger. I can just confirm it and collaborate it by the jogger it, it is This is also in Odessa. You see a huge surface was prepared and two prepared very nicely like a notice board and here we get rocketed 1 to 5 and 6 to 14 and 11 12 13 they were skipped in jagad then the second part that is here we get only the first one here which is separate rocketed 2 engraved on the top portion and then the separate rocketed 1 was engraved here so definitely this came first, then this and the rest of the place uh, portion was actually left for future communications to come. So these are later communications actually not, which do not fit into the schemes of the major rocketic. So we should actually look at them as separate and not as major rocketic uh, 15 and 16 as Sarkar says. Now, going, moving to Nittur. Uh, now, again, going to Karnataka from here in Ballari district, we get two separate rocks. So, as I had mentioned earlier, Nittur and Uregola are the twin sites where we get minor rocketics. So, minor rocketic one, minor rocketic two are engraved separately in two different boulders. These are the two boulders. And something very interesting is that. You can see it on the foothills, uh, we have these two huge rocks and it is engraved in round. So line one starts from here, ends here. Again, line two starts from here and goes round and ends. So it is very difficult to read. You know, one person has to go round and round and read and then come back to the position one and then again start. So it's not in complete round, but 
it almost is more than a semicircle. So this shows that actually, and uh, one more thing which I should mention is it goes till the end. You can see it is still here. So how is one supposed to read this? It is very difficult to read. So it is actually not for reading because there were very few people who could read and write. At least when you are talking about uh, the um, Ashokan records in Prakrit and in Brahmi characters, who will read them? Because people not, are not well conversant with the language, neither do they know Brahmi script. So it's something new to them. So they are not supposed to read it. There is a person who will read it. So there is an orator, a narrator of the inscription who is employed here and who will read and probably also interpret it in the local language. So this is just the evidence saying that this is the royal order in the uh, verbal order of the ruler. So it almost became a kind of a uh, monument as uh, Professor Bandha Singh would like us to believe. And uh, see, then as I had said, they are engraved till the end and very difficult to read almost. Now, uh, let us move to the twin site of Udegala. This is the site of Udegala on like, in the field, you have to cross this field to reach uh, the exact location. This is uh, Rocket Dict 1, and uh, Udegola is in Ballari district, same as Natur. And here is Rocket Dict 2. So, 1 and 2 are here on two separate rocks. And there is a, a very uh, small story which I should actually narrate to all of you that uh, where uh, Rocket Dict 1 is there, it's a beautiful uh, rock which they have selected. It's a flat rock like surface and almost like a lotus board and vertically it is engraved and what is interesting is that once it caught fire because villagers used to stack their hay here and once it caught fire so they just chiseled it off to just get it clean and we have lost the Ashokan most partial, major portion of the Ashokan inscription eventually like due to this scrubbing of the rock and uh, which is really sad actually so you see the these sites are located very close but when we uh, just see the activity of the engravers there are two different types of engravers engraving it one is going round and the other one is engraving it like a notice board so these are not the same persons doing it which is very interesting because one would expect that since the scribes and engravers are traveling so to save cost they would be sent to, they would be given the charge of two, two localities each day, which are twin sites, but this was not done. And here you see again, the two rock, which is very interesting. Now from Nitur, I'll move to another twin site that is Gavimat and Palki Gundu. So this is the site of Gavimat in Kobbal district. And this is the rock. You can see it's very difficult to climb. You can just place one foot here and then climb up there and reach this portion where the Ashokan <coughs> inscription is there, engraved here in an inclined rock. And we also get Buddha Padas. Uh, at several uh, sites, we get this Buddha Padas, which have been probably engraved by one of the devotees, a Buddhist devotee. And, and this is on an inclined surface. The Ashokan inscription is here on an inclined surface. We can read it very clearly. And you can see the size of the Buddha Pada. And I've used my foot to just uh, make a scale. Uh, the size of the Buddha Pada. This is the vicinity of Gavimat. Uh, I'll just quickly pass on because we are running out of time. Then the twin site with Gavimat is Palki Gundu. Gavimat is not very high up from the ground level, but Palki Gundu is quite, quite high and very difficult to climb, and it's the like highest inscription uh, in southern part of the subcontinent. So uh, you see that Palki Gundu is also in the uh, same district, it is Kobal, and it is like a palanquin, you know, it looks like a palanquin when you look at it from a distance. So it's called a palanquin rock. So you have to climb up there and here is the Ashokan inscription. But how will people know from here that there is an inscription up there? So you see, we are just climbing. It's it was quite a difficult climb. And once you are here, how will somebody know that there is an Ashokan inscription here? So they had probably um, like put some flags over here because you can see some post holes all around. So probably they were uh, flags which would indicate that here is an Ashokan inscription. And uh, so from here, now let me move to another territory.
altogether and uh, the other territory was called suvarnagiri whereas this territory where we are entering is actually the territory in the frontier and it is called the territory of isila in the territory of isila we have three major sites jatinga rameshwar siddhapura and brahmagiri and a typical character about the isila sites is that the inscriptions are not vertical like like this but they are horizontal that is they are on the surface they are engraved on the surface and another very important thing about the isila territory is that uh, they have the name of a scribe lipikara engraved in kharoshti and also in brahmi so here the lipikara was actually signing his name who came all the way from either afghanistan or taxila or that not western part of the subcontinent because in among the ashokan inscriptions you only get the use of kharoshti in ashabas kadi and manshera so uh, you know that uh, definitely uh, this person would have come all the way from uh, north western part of the subcontinent and we also know that people used to come from taxila in as a quinquennial tour the officers used to come so this lipikar also would have come and uh, he is instructing uh, the people you know like uh, he says that there is a uh, you can say a prologue to the inscription where he says that the mahamatras at isila should be greeted then you should ask them good health and then communicate that uh, devanang priya priya dasi raja says thus then the order follows so probably when you read this it uh, indicates that this is a verbal order which is actually given how to behave what to do so when you reach the territory of isila then greet the mahamatras ask them good health do this do that and then finally give this order so probably this was not supposed to be engraved this was the order which was said that don't engrave this part only engrave this part but eventually in the process of communication they just lost it so the communication was lost and who has written this order to sign it he had signed his name in kharoshti and also in brahmi saying that authenticated by the scribe that lipikara uh, that is um, chapada so he mentions his name but very importantly ashoka does not allow anybody to mention their names you know nobody's name has been mentioned only a, he himself mentions his queen's name but other than that we do not get any names in the ashoka inscription so how would we allow a lipikara to uh, mention his name so it was a miscommunication or by mistake they had engraved the portions which were actually portions not to be engraved the instructive part now let us see the sites of jatinga rameshwar the, there are two hills by the name of jatinga the bigger jatinga and the smaller jatinga the jatinga hill gets its name from uh, jatayu whose wings had actually fallen here there is a myth actually the portion which you see it's engraved on the surface as i had told on the ground and the portion you can see here is the kharoshti letters here again i have put the kharoshti letters which we reads chapadena hmm. now similar things have been also found in brahmagiri similar inscription and uh, this is all the brahmagiri is also uh, the site of brahmagiri is located in chitradurg district chitradurg district and so is siddhapura and uh, uh, this is the site you can have the view of it this is the wonderful inscription engraved very very neatly on a big rock and it's called mantra gundu and akshara gundu because people used to wash this rock to uh, get gain good health so uh, there are several myths associated with it and siddhapura site is very interesting uh, so siddhapura and brahmagiri actually were twin sites jatinga rameshwar is in the dinda so siddhapura is very interesting because out of all the ashokan sites only siddhapura is called ashokana siddhapura so the name of ashok still uh, is uh, associated with siddhapura and again it's on the surface and uh, chapada who was a lipikara came from northwestern part of the subcontinent and he is not the only one who had come actually from northwestern part of the subcontinent even many more engravers also came i'll show it to you how because even in chunar which is near alabad you get some kharoshti inscriptions of engravers writing their names so um, 
again i'll discuss this matter a little later but then uh, the pattern of engraving is interesting some vertical some horizontal and some inclined and the uh, horizontal ones are in palke gundu rajul mandagiri siddapur and jatinga rameshwar so this is again and also in brahmagiri Uh, brahmagiri is a little inclined surface but still we can consider it as also as horizontal um, and the vertical uh, this is the vertical these are verticals all of them engraving uh, this is horizontal and this is uh, inclined what do we call inclined actually so now from here let us move to andhra pradesh we have seen almost all the sites of karnataka by now now let us move to andhra pradesh that is eragodi and uh, the site of eragodi is very interesting because here we get minor rock edicts as well as major rock edicts and uh, so you can see here that uh, um, this is the uh, minor rock edict very quickly i'll just browse through things because now the time is almost over and uh, here is the minor rock edict 1 and 2 combined which has been engraved and rest of the major rock edicts are engraved all over so randomly you know like they are not sequentially engraved so minor rock edict 1 and 2 the engravers made a major mistake because the scribes and engravers are two different groups altogether you know the scribe send its uh, sends uh, his document uh, written on a talpatra or a bhujapatra that is birch bark or a palm leaf manuscript or on a cloth and that will be copied by the engravers on the stone by using their chisels and hammers so uh, here we see that the engravers may or may not be literate so here in case of eragodi you see that one line in the uh, draft that is the scribe's document uh, actually consists of two lines in the engraving of the rock so line 1 and line 2 are line 1 of the draft which they were actually copying and here two people are working from two ends trying to come and meet at the center so once they had finished one portion then they had to decide that how will they do the second la second line so uh, they were expert engravers so their supervisor would have left to rajul mandagiri maybe to supervise and by that time they reached they finished line 1 and they wanted to engrave line 2 so they did not know where to start from from right to left or left to right since they had arrived from uh, northwestern part of the subcontinent according to them the norm was to engrave from right to left so they started doing it the other way round and that's why all the blue lines are right to left all the yellow lines are left to right so they start with this but they finally end up doing the other way round so the whole inscription is not boast of eden so this shows the pattern so by the time they read the supervisor came back and told them oh you are doing a mistake they had already engraved almost the whole of the inscription so and the red ones you see these are the portions which they have which when they are doing it from two ends uh, and meeting there are certain things which are left so when they were doing this particular line both were coming from two ends and when they met here then four letters were still to be engraved four or five so they just did it here so it's very interesting kind so we have just solved the eragodi puzzle by this and quickly i'll just go to rajul mandagiri the site of rajul mandagiri has a, a minor rock edict only there so eragodi has all the major as well so this is a ashokan inscription here and a beautiful inscription so before ending let me just mention one thing that in andhra pradesh we also have amravati i've also talked about amravati which is a an fragmentary pillar but the context is this <coughs> sorry in south india we get so many inscriptions but when we look at the archaeological context the material context we do not find that much of development as compared to now so the mauryan empire was only and only extracting things from the south and not looking after the development so um, that i will just answer all the questions gradually uh, when you just po uh, pose the questions <clears throat> but for now the time is over so let me just wind up by thanking the hyderabad karnataka region development board and my university that's university of calcutta who had sponsored our project on this and uh, 
Also, thanks to my research scholars Shomo and Shomita, and also Durbar Sharma, and uh, Professor B P Sahu, Vinay Kumar, who Professor Ranbi Chakravarti, Professor K M Shremali, Professor Setter, who had given interviews for my documentary, which I had done on um, this uh, Ashoka Chakra Karnataka, and uh, then uh, Rajiv and Ramche. Who had had accompanied me for taking photographs and doing the videography for the film and direction of the film was done by Ranjit and also the regional commissioner of HKRDB, the then regional commissioner Amla Aditya Vishwas. I would like to thank him as well and thank you all for uh, patient listening. And uh, I would like to invite questions. Thank you. <laughs>